Well, first of all, thank you to Allison and Paul for inviting me um, for this um, uh, workshop and for a really great introduction to our session. I think they've set up uh, my talk really well and several of the other talks. So I'm Charu Vardarajan. I'm a research scientist in the Earth and Environmental Sciences area at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and I'm also a research affiliate with the Berkeley Institute of Data Sciences. Um, so I use, um, I'm a biogeochemist and use a lot of data science methods in my research. And this particular work is from a project that's looking to predict the impacts of extreme disturbances, such as floods and droughts on river water quality. And I really like how Allison had set us up for this uh, term of uh, predictive understanding here that's in the title, which is really this intersection of inference predictions and distillation, um, really all of that comes together and that's really why that term predictive understanding is used to. Um, so. so the reason why we, you know, water quality for those of you who are not very familiar consists of several um, physical, chemical and biological variables in uh, the water, in particular rivers here. And it's really important for the biota that live in the streams as well as human health and other ecosystem services. And so water managers have to meet certain water quality criteria, and they need these sorts of robust predictions at multiple scales, regional to basin scales, sub-daily to decadal temporal scales, so they can make optimal decisions uh, when they want to think about uh, how they or, you know, manage your water resources for the long term. Now, unfortunately, it is uh, the extreme events such as floods and droughts actually negatively impact water quality. Here on the left, you see this picture. This is actually from an earlier heat wave but we saw a recent heat wave in the Pacific Northwest where a lot of fish were really affected and, and fish populations decreased substantially because of this massive heat wave that took place in the Pacific Northwest. And on the right, you see how um, some, uh, there are uh, lots of billions of dollars actually being invested across um, several places where these sorts of negative impacts happen to prevent these. So in this case, um, California and in, in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta is trying to prevent saltwater intrusion into this uh, very sensitive ecosystem. And so, and if you looked at the IPCC report that just came out yesterday, unfortunately for us, um, floods, droughts, and heat waves are all going to increase um, in the next, um, uh, over the next century. So the goal here is to say, how do we understand and predict these impacts of extreme events on river water quality, and more importantly, determine what attributes of watersheds can make them more resilient to these types of disturbances and using mostly data-driven approaches. And by data-driven, I include uh, knowledge-guided machine learning. So this work builds on three major science questions that are really structured to add complexity and cross these different spatial scales. And the first question, which has been mostly what we've focused on for this first, uh, for this uh, last couple of years, is to understand how disturbances change water quality at a single location. Um, so point to reach spatial scales at short and long time scales. And the second one starts to expand on the spatial scale and start to look at understanding impacts downstream along the river corridor and across river orders. And the third one starts to look at how uh, landscape interactions with the rivers determine, uh, and, and particularly watershed characteristics such as climate, um, land use, uh, land cover, geology, all of these determine the watershed resilience to these disturbances with the goal of finally coming up with some sort of a resilience index, which is a function of the disturbance as well as the watershed characteristics. So let's talk about some of the constraints we're dealing with. And uh, Paul and uh, Allison alluded to this earlier. Um, so some, first of all, uh, disturbances can occur anywhere, anytime. Um, so you, know, you have to be prepared to have a generalized model that works in many places. Um, they can be multi-scale. So you can have local flood events that last a few days, and then you could have multi-year droughts that just span the entire Western US. So um, you have to be thinking about uh, being able to scale up and scale down in your models. And you can have compound events. So you don't necessarily just have it. You can't look at the event individually at that time. You have to think about the system memory or the history um, so if you had a long drought and then you had a flood, the system response could be very different if that prior drought hadn't occurred. So system memory matters, and sometimes the memory can be several years, not just a few months. Um, and as, as uh, mentioned earlier, we have very sparse data, and especially sparse data when you're thinking about extremes, by definition, they're extremes, and so there's not as much data there. 
Um, and finally, water quality is just very complex. There are so many variables, there are so many drivers. So this picture here from a, a publication a few years ago kind of summarizes all the different factors that go into predicting river quality. And so what that means is there's gonna be a lot of data that you really need, the complexity of the data that's needed to be doing accurate predictions here. So why are we interested in knowledge-guided machine learning? Now, there are, um, Partly because process-based models are incomplete because there's just so much complexity, as I showed in the prior slide. And it's not just physics that we need to consider. Uh, we have chemistry, so reactive transport is really important for a lot of the variables. But you also have microbial reactions that mediate a lot of the, uh, the water quality variables. And finally, uh, but not the least, humans. And humans are, you know, people, when we put fertilizers on our um, farms and they run off into streams that causes a lot of water quality issues, for example. So there's so much and it's so uh, so hard to sort of build process-based bottom-up models. So we don't really have good pro uh, first principles-based models that work at large spatial scales and at high resolution. Those that exist tend to be over price for some regions and they're just very expensive to run. Um, but on the other hand, if you just think about black box machine learning, um, the data availability is really a problem, especially when you start to throw in all the other variables that you need for prediction. So if you say you want stream flow, as well as land use, as well as all these other things, and for the same period and for the same region, you start to really, really have very few regions where you have all the overlapping co-located variables. Um, another problem that we have is that because of the complexity of water quality and all the factors that can influence it, you end up dealing with very high dimensional data sets. And in some cases, multimodal, you might need to consider remote sensing uh, or geospatial information along with time series information. So it starts to then become a computationally expensive when you're really thinking about such high dimensional data. So it generally tends to work when you have lots of data and simpler variables, but the moment you get into anything more than you know, a, a simple problem that start, you need knowledge-guided machine learning to guide how you do your feature selection and a, a lot of the other things that were, was mentioned earlier. Um, so for this particular presentation, I'm focusing on stream temperature. That's one of the variables, but we're also looking at salinity and dissolved oxygen. And Temperature is kind of a favorite for knowledge guided machine learning, I think, because it does behave physically and there are, you know, physical equations that we can use to constrain stream temperature and, and similarly salinity tends to be mostly conserved species so you can uh, use physical models for predictions but once you get into dissolved oxygen that's where a lot of the reactive transport microbial processes and the human influences start to come into the picture so it, it is more complex. Um, Oops. Okay, here. So the objectives for our machine learning models, first of all, were to develop these models for water temperature, but our goal and our objective is different from a lot of what you're going to see in the in this session. We're not focused on forecasting. We're really focused on understanding the drivers of water temperature across these different regions and these disturbance events. So for that purpose, we chose low to intermediate complexity models that are more interpretable. So regression models, uh, which is support vector regression, random forest, mixed G boost. Um, and what we wanted to do was to start to expand to different scales. So here you see in this figure, we started with the point scale, which are individual stations. And then we wanted to go to stations using one model for multiple stations and start to build up regionally. Now, this is where I was just telling you about the data availability problem. Once you start to impose a constraint saying, I just want stations with at least 20 years of water temperature data, you have dramatically fewer stations than if you just say, I want any, you know, any station that had any water temperature data. Um, and we wanted longer peri periods of record, primarily because of the focus on disturbances. Uh, these can occur, you know, over several, they don't occur all the time. So you, you do need a longer record uh, when you're specifically focused on disturbances. Um, I would also say that we started with monthly water temperature, since that is a pretty common time scale for this kind of disturbance uh, analysis, but we, uh, and especially for droughts or something like that, which can occur over very long periods. 
Um, so the data sources that we uh, used were meteorology, which we use a gridded product called DayMed, which is at one kilometer resolution, gives you several different variables, and water temperature and discharge from the USGS National Water Information System. Um, and we, we did look at some exploratory data analysis, the figure on the right showing you several different processes that can impact stream temperature. And, and based on this, we just said that we could start with the, these few variables. It's important to say that solar radiation is actually a very important variable for uh, stream temperature and not all the meteorological forcings that are available typically have solar radiation. So PRISM, which is very uh, popular, for example, doesn't have solar radiation. So that was one of the factors that went into choosing data. And for now, we're running this at the Mid-Atlantic and Pacific Northwest regions. And we were looking at both pristine and human impacted regions and, and down selected to 75 stations that had a minimum of 20 years of uh, data. So first we did this at the individual point scales where you have in, uh, single stations. Um, and that's, you know, we got pretty good predictions for the majority of the stations. Uh, by pretty good, I mean your root mean squared error of uh, less than a degree centigrade uh, Celsius. And that's just using very simple inputs, these meteorology, the month of the year to indicate seasonality and discharge. But a few stations had higher error and we suspected that might've been because of the human impacts. Um, so, what we then did was to look at the feature importance, um, which uh, there were several talks earlier this morning that kind of indicates this. This we were using mostly to test what were the variables that really the model was picking up on for these two different models. And it turns out that mean air temperature is the most important variable, at least for our models. And just keep that in mind because that's important when we talk about it later on. So we now try to use what knowledge we had gained at these simple models, at these monthly point scale models, but then translate that to building these generalized models for these 75 stations across these different regions. But now we know there were some stations that didn't do as well at the point scale. So we were hypothesizing that maybe the water temperature dynamics are different for free flowing reaches versus damp reaches. And so we classified these stations using a approach that was in a recent paper <laughs> and that's just looking at the number of major dams in a basin. And we built two separate models for the two separate groups, but added three basic station attributes as predictors, which is lat, long, and elevation. And we intentionally chose these three attributes because these are broadly available metadata. As we heard earlier, you may not have basin characteristics for all uh, that are available for all locations. And we wanted to be really able to predict these um, water temperatures at any location, partly because disturbances can occur anywhere. So uh, what we're finding is there is a bit of a trade-off uh, in accuracy, but generalized models are doing pretty well. These are early results, and we're, we're going to refine some of our hyperparameter optimization. So hopefully, you can improve upon um, this accuracy of 1.5 degrees Celsius. But there are some stations that show uh, poor performance at extremes, and there may be some bias that we have to correct. But in general, we have pretty decent accuracy for most of these free-flowing stations. But for the dam stations, um, there were some stations that did really well. Just using the simple model, we could actually predict dammed uh, 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 flow uh, water temperatures pretty well. But there were some that didn't do well. And what we found was actually that gauges dam classification, although it helped reduce this computational cost, didn't really help us in any way. So what we know now is that just separating by um, that particular method of saying this is dammed versus undammed is not really helping. And that we need some other means of classification of these different stations to figure out uh, what, what might help improve our accuracy. So what we're now doing is to look at these uh, time series dynamics of these signals and then trying to cluster them here using mostly uh, your statistical properties and what we're realizing is actually the behavior of these different signals are different compared to the prior grouping by major dams in the basin. So now what we're trying to do is to look at the watershed attributes and seeing what contributes these to these different time series dynamics. So just a few key takeaways, just injecting a little bit of knowledge. This is not fully the knowledge guided in machine learning where you have you know, process-based models or equations or something. This is just a little bit of knowledge into your low complexity black box machine learning actually works pretty well for stream temperature, and it makes it much more interpretable and computationally less expensive than deep learning models. And using very simple inputs, such as meteorology, basic attributes, 
means that you can actually predict water temperatures anywhere, which is kind of what you need for the disturbances. But and we also find that they're fairly transferable between the two hydrologic regions that we studied, the Pacific Northwest and the Mid-Atlantic. But a well, few things, caveats. Our early results indicate that once you start to change scales, the machine learning models and input features are not exactly the same. So we just went, I showed you a case where we went from point scale to regional scale, and we already had to add a few attributes like lat long and elevation. Now we tried this from going from monthly to daily, um, and we find that that's not, again, we need to add a lot more variables because primarily because the physics is actually different at these different time scales. The processes that impact water temperature at monthly time scale could be mostly air temperature. Whereas when you go to daily, you're going to need solar radiation, you're going to need groundwater, you're going to need a snow melt, a lot of other things. When you go to sub daily, there's an extra set of processes to be considered, which may be shading, maybe wind mixing. There's a lot more complexity as you start to go down scales. And so unfortunately, the question I have in my mind is, can we ever have one model to rule them out across scales? Maybe, maybe not. I think the jury's out on this, but as you start to translate scales, well, you have to think about the physics itself being different. And that's important. And this is why knowledge guided machine learning is really helpful um, for these sort of scale translation. So finally, I wanna just end saying, since I started out with um, disturbances as a sort of a theme here, what we're doing with these models now is trying to understand the heat wave impacts on water temperature. So remember that I said that, you know, air temperature turned out to be the most important predictor, which for us meant that more than floods and droughts, heat waves are actually a really important disturbance for water temperature. And so here I'm showing a few months in the Pacific North, two stations in the Pacific Northwest. One is a free flowing reach on the top, one is a dam breach on the bottom, and looking at a massive heat wave that occurred in 2015. Um, and what we're seeing is that um, for the top, actually, you know, the, the water temperature signal fairly follows very closely the air temperature. And that's partly because of the equilibration can happen very quickly. But in these dam breaches, initially, when there was a release, the water temperature went down. But look, over time, actually, the water temperature is not necessarily, you know, keeping it cool. So this is the kind of things we're now trying to say, we built these machine learning models of these scales, and then let's try to apply that to study the impacts of heat waves. So with that, I just want to end and thank everyone for your attention. Uh, this work is mostly going to be written up in a paper that we hope to submit very soon. Um, and, and here's our website for the project. You can keep track of all our publications. I also want to say, um, and I also want to acknowledge Helen Weyerbach, who did a lot of the work I presented today, and Misha Lubich, a summer intern with me. Um, so one thing that you all might find useful is the Department of Energy, which funded this work, uh, had a recent call for white papers uh, for AI for Earth system processes earlier this year. Um, and there are about hundreds of white papers that have been released on this link here on this website. Several of them call out knowledge guided machine learning. A few of us submitted a white paper on using machine learning for predicting impacts of extreme water cycle impacts on river water quality. So that's a paper uh, that's the DOI there, but I would encourage you all to go and read many of the other white papers and interesting ideas on that site. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chair. What a great start to this session. Um, and thanks also for those, those links to the DOE white papers. Uh, we have a, a couple of questions already in Slido, and I want to remind the attendees that Slido is the place to be putting your questions to get Chair to answer them. Uh, one easy one, potentially, someone says, maybe I missed this, but was there a type of model that generally performed best out of the machine learning models that were used, like XGBoost or Random Forest? Yeah, the XGBoost and the Random Forest were somewhat comparable. For different stations, actually, some of them were slightly different, uh, but more or less, they all they all were sort of similar and they all beat the baseline models, which was the persistence, the multilinear regression, and some historical means. So I would say that it's you know, the random forest and XG boost are very comparable, um, more, more or less. Great, and then another question, is there a difference in extreme events for drivers versus extreme events as responses? And is machine learning better at predicting the fat tails of distributions on water quality? Yeah, that's an interesting question here, um, partly because, um, yeah, we've thought about 
there, there's a way of thinking about extreme events and how that actually causes the cha uh, change in uh, water quality, which is different from finding the extreme events in the water quality signals themselves. Um, and I think part of the, the machine learning models are not right now super suited for predicting extremes. And the problem is because the loss functions in general tend to bias towards the mean, the data are more biased towards the mean. So this I think is actually a really challenging area for research is really thinking about how do you start to predict those extreme uh, tails of the distrib distribution. We thought about some ways like maybe training more heavily on data just for those extremes or, or maybe just breaking up the regimes and tre treating those uh, separately as drought regimes versus flood regimes. But I think this is a really active area of research. Thanks. 